So my name's John, I'm a software engineer at Airbnb. And uh, firstly, I need to apologize for the American spelling uh, in the title. It's, oh, sorry. Um, so this afternoon, Chris and I would like to talk about the data portal. It's an internal data tool that we're developing to help uh, with data discovery and decision making. And specifically, we're gonna talk about how we modeled and engineered the solution, sort of um, centered around uh, Neo4j. So firstly, um, what is Airbnb? Um, so Airbnb is an online marketplace that connects people uh, to unique travel experiences. So both Chris and myself, we work uh, in an internal data tools team, where our job is to really help ensure that Airbnb uh, makes data-informed business decisions. So what's the problem here? So the problem we're gonna to describe to today and what the data portal project attempts to address is the proliferation of tribal knowledge. Relying on tribal knowledge often stifles productivity. So as Airbnb grows, so the challenges around the volume, the complexity, and the obscurity of data. So in a large and complex organization with a sea of data resources, users often struggle to find the right data. So we often run an employee survey and consistently score really poorly around the question, the information I need to do my job is easy to find. Data is often siloed, it's inaccessible, and it lacks context. So I'm actually a recovering data scientist um, who wants to sort of democratize data and provide context wherever possible. So at Airbnb, we have over 200,000 uh, tables in our Hive data warehouse um, that's spread across multiple clusters. And when I joined Airbnb uh, last year, it wasn't evident how you could actually find the right table. So we built a prototype leveraging previous insights, uh, giving users the ability to search for the metadata. So we quickly realized we're somewhat myopic in our thinking. Um, we should sort of explore well beyond just data tables. So at Airbnb, we have over 10,000 superset charts and dashboards. Supersets are an open source sort of a data analytics uh, platform. We have an excess of 6,000 experiments and metrics. We have, an, again, uh, six, over 6,000 Tableau workbooks and charts and over 1,500 knowledge posts. And that's an open source kind of knowledge sharing platform that data scientists use to share their results. Uh, as well as like a litany, a, literary, a litany of other data types. But most importantly, uh, there's over 3,500 employees at Airbnb. And I really can't kind of stress enough how sort of valuable people are as a data resource. Um, surfacing he, who may be uh, the point of contact uh, for a resource is just as pertinent as a resource itself. Uh, to further complicate matters, uh, we're dispersed sort of geographically uh, with, offices, uh, with over 20 offices worldwide. So what's the sort of the mandate of the data portal? So quite simply, it's to democratize data, to empower Airbnb employees to be data informed by aiding with data exploration, discovery, and trust. So let's talk about the concept of what this is. So at a very high level, we just want to search for something. Um, the question is how do we frame our data in a meaningful uh, way for searching? And we have to be very cognizant of the fact of sort of ranking and relevance as well. So it should be fairly evident what we actually feed into our search indices. Uh, it's all these data resources and their associated meta types. Um, but the question for us is are we missing something here? And we feel, yes, um, our ecosystem is a graph. Um, the data resources are nodes. And uh, the connectivity is the edges or relationships. Um, re the relationships sort of provide the necessary linkages uh, between our siloed uh, data components. And the ability to understand um, the entire data ecosystem, um, all the way from logging to sort of consumption. 
So, you know, relationships are extremely pertinent uh, for us. Uh, knowing who created or consumed a resource, in this case it's a Tableau chart, is sort of, is just as valuable as the resource itself. So we actually gather information from a, a plethora of uh, disjoint tools, and that would be really great if we could sort of provide additional context. So let's sort of walk through a kind of a high-level example here. So you sort of leveraging event logs, we actually discover a user consumes a Tableau chart um, which lacks context. So digging through, um, sorry, sort of piecing things together here, we actually uh, we discover that the chart is from a Tableau workbook. Uh, the direction of this edge is somewhat uh, ambiguous, um, but we prefer the many to one direction from both a, a flow and sort of a, rele a relevancy perspective. So digging a little further, um, both these resources were created by another user. Um, now we have this indirect relationship between these users. Um, this, the creator may serve as a really good point of contact that can uh, provide additional context around the data. We then discover that the workbook was uh, derived from some aggregated table that lives in Hive, um, thus exposing the underlying data to the user. Then we pass out the Hive audit logs, and we, it's determined that this table is actually then derived from another table, and that actually provides us with the underlying data. And finally, both these tables are associated with the same Hive schema, um, which may provide additional context uh, with regards to the nature of the data. So how do we go about sort of constructing this uh, concept? So we leverage all these data sources and we build a graph uh, comprising of the nodes and relationships. And this resides in Hive. Um, we pull from a number of different things. So, um, so actually Hive is our sort of persistent data store uh, where the table schema sort of mimics Neo4j. So we have like a notion of labels and properties and maybe a, an ID. Um, we pull from over six databases that come through scrapes that land up in Hive. Um, we query a number of APIs, be that Google, Slack, um, and also some uh, logging frameworks. And that all goes into an Airflow DAG, and Airflow is our uh, open source workflow tool that was also developed at Airbnb. And then uh, this workflow is run every day, and the graph is left to soak uh, to prevent what we call graph, graph flickering. So how do we address this issue? So our sort of graph is somewhat time agnostic. Um, it merely just represents the most recent snapshot of the ecosystem. Um, the issue is certain types of relationships are sporadic in nature, and thus causing the graph to flicker. So we resolve this by uh, introducing the sort of notion of relational state, and we have two such things. There's persistent and transient. So persistent relationships sort of represent a snapshot of time of the system. So it's like, it's a result of a DB scrape. So in this example, uh, the creator relationship will sort of persist forever. So transient relationships, on the other hand, um, sort of represent events that are somewhat sporadic in nature. So in this example, the consumer relationship would only sort of exist on certain days, which would cause the graph to flicker. So the remedy to solve this is we simply expand the time period from one to a, tr a trailing 28-day uh, period window, which sort of acts as a smoothing function. So this ensures we, uh, the graph doesn't flicker, but it also we capture only recent and thus relevant inf consumption information uh, into our graph. So let's talk about how data ends up in uh, Neo4j and, and sort of downstream resources. So this is a very simplified view of our data path, uh, which in itself is a graph. Um, and so given that relationship, relationships have parity with nodes, it's pertinent that we also discuss um, the conduit which sort of connects these systems. So every day, um, the data starts off in Hive. We use Airflow uh, to push it to Python. So in Python, uh, we have actually, the graph is represented uh, in network X as an object. And from this, we actually compute a weighted page rank on the graph, and that helps a lot uh, to improve search ranking. The data is then pushed uh, to uh, Neo4j via the uh, Neo4j driver. We all know what Neo4j is. Um, 
but we have to be kind of cognizant of how we do a merge here. So the graph database is live, and every day we're pushing updates from Hive uh, into the graph database. So that's sort of something we've got to be quite cautious of. So from here, it sort of forks into two directions. The nodes get pushed uh, into Elasticsearch uh, via Near4 gra a Near, sorry, uh, a GraphAware uh, plugin, um, which is based on transaction hooks. And from there, Elasticsearch will serve as our search engine, and this is a fairly common uh, technology used at Airbnb. Finally, we use Flask as a lightweight Python web app, um, and this again is used with other data tools. So results from Elasticsearch queries are fetched by the web server. And additionally, um, results from Neo4j queries pertaining to connectivity are fetched uh, from the, by the web server via Neo4j uh, using that same driver. So why do we choose Neo4j as our graph database? Uh, there's four main reasons. One, it kind of felt logical, right? Our, our uh, data represents a graph, so it felt logical to use a, a graph uh, database as well to store the data. It's nimble. Um, we're using a, we wanted a really fast, performant uh, system. It's popular, right? It's the world's number one uh, graph database. And the community edition was free. Um, this is really super helpful for sort of exploring and pro prototyping. And finally, this integrates really well. Like, it integrates well with Python and Elasticsearch. These are existing technologies we want to leverage. So there's actually a lovely symbiotic relationship between Elasticsearch and Neo4j, and that's all courtesy of some GraphAware plugins. And there's two such plugins. The first one's this Neo4j plugin, and what it does is it asynchronously replicates data from Neo4j to Elasticsearch. Um, that means we actually don't need to sort of actively manage our Elasticsearch cluster. It's sort of all our data sort of pertain, uh, persists. And, sorry, we use Neo4j sort of as, as a, the, the source of truth. And then the second one is a, a plugin that actually lives in Elasticsearch, um, but it allows Elasticsearch to consult with Neo4j um, during a, uh, the Neo4j database during a search. And this allows us to uh, enrich search rankings um, by leveraging the graph topology. So an example was we could sort by recently created, which is a property on the relationship, or most consumed, we actually have to explore the topology of the graph. So let's just look at the sort of, a, this is a sort of how we represent our data model. Um, and um, so we sort of defined a node label hierarchy as follows. Um, uh, this enables us to organize data in both Neo4j and Hive. The sort of the top level entity label is really uh, represents some base abstract node type and uh, I'll explain the relevancy of that later. So let's just walk through a few examples here. Um, our schema is created in such a way that the nodes are globally unique in our database by combining the set of labels uh, and the locally scoped ID property. So in the first example, we have a user who's keyed by their LDAP username. We have a table that's keyed by the table name. And the final, we have a, a Tableau chart that's keyed by you know, the corresponding DB instance inside the Tableau database. So, um, so the graph queries are heavily leveraged uh, in the UI, and they need to be incredibly fast. So we, uh, we can efficiently match queries um, by defining per-label indices uh, on the ID property, and um, we leverage these for fast, fast access. Um, here we're just explicitly forcing the use of the index because we're using multiple labels. So ideally, we'd love to have a sort of a more abstract representation of the graph, sort of moving from sort of the sort of local to global uniqueness. So how do we go about doing that? So we actually leverage another GraphAware plugin it's called the UUID plugin. And what this does, it actually it assigns a global UUID uh, on newly created entities um, that cannot be mutated or in any way. And this allows us to use a sort of um, so this sort of gives us global uniqueness. And now we can sort of talk about entities in the graph by just this one unique UUID property in addition to the entity label. This helps us use parameterized queries, which leads to faster query and execution times. And this is especially relevant when we do bulk loads. So every day we're doing a bulk load of, of data, and we need that to be really performant. 
So here's the same sort of example before. Now we've simplified this. We can just purely match an entity using this UUID property, and it's global. So we have a RESTful API, um, uh, and the endpoints are sort of of this form. So the first one, you can sort of match a node based on its sort of labels and IDs. And this is useful um, if you have like a slug type of URL. The second one, you can sort of match a node based purely on the UUID. And the third one is how we'd match a uh, we'd get a created relationship based on leveraging these two UUIDs. So this is a good segue to hand it over to Chris, who's going to talk about the front end, uh, which leverages this API. Can you hear me? Cool. All right, yeah, so as John said, uh, I'm Chris. I'm a data visualization engineer at Airbnb. I also work on data-rich uh, user interfaces. And I'll be talking about the front end. Um, so basically, now that John has introduced the fascinating data resource graph that we have on the back end, um, which I think is interesting in and of itself, I'll be describing how we enable Airbnb employees to harness its power through the web application. Um, so first I want to start off by saying that the back ends of data tools are often uh, so complex that the design of the front end is an afterthought. Um, this should never be the case, and in fact, the complexity and data density of uh, these tools makes intentional design even more critical. So I'm sure everyone here appreciates the friendly uh, Neo4j UI. Um, and so one of our project goals is to help build trust in data. As users encounter painful or buggy interactions, these can chip away at their trust in your tool. On the other hand, a delightful data product can build trust and confidence. Um, and so therefore, with the data portal, we decided to embrace a product mindset um, from the start and ensure a thoughtful user interface and experience. So to do this, we actually uh, interviewed um, users across the company to assess needs and pain points around data resources and tribal knowledge. And from these interviews, three overall user personas kind of emerged. Um, I want to point out that these span data literacy levels and many different use cases. So the first of these we'll call Daphne Data. She is a technical data power user, the epitome of a tribal knowledge holder. She's in the trenches tracing data lineage, but she also spends a lot of time explaining, uh, like pointing others to these resources. Next we have Manager Mel. Perhaps she's less data literate, um, but she still needs to keep tabs on her team's resources, share them with others, and uh, stay up to date with other teams that she interact interacts with. Um, finally, we have Nathan New. Maybe he is new to Airbnb, maybe he's working with a new team, or he's new to data. In any case, he has like no clue what's going on and really quickly needs to get ramped up. So with these personas in mind, we basically built out the front end of the data portal um, to support data exploration, discovery, and trust through a variety of product features, which I'll describe in more detail in the next slides. Uh, at a high level, um, these broadly include search, uh, more in-depth resource detail and metadata exploration, and then user-centric, team-centric, and company-centric um, data. So I also want to point out that we're not really allowing free-form exploration of our graph, um, as the Neo4j UI does. This is a pretty highly curated view of the graph, which attempts to provide utility while maintaining guardrails where necessary for less data literate employees. So we'll jump in here. Um, so the data portal is primarily a data resource search engine. So clearly it has to have pretty killer search functionality. From this screen capture, you can tell that we tried to embrace a clean and minimalistic design. So this aesthetic allows us um, to maintain clarity despite all the data content, which adds a lot of complexity on its own. We also tried to make the app feel really fast and snappy. Um, slow interactions generally disincentivize exploration. And I'll point out a couple other aspects of our search experience here. So at the top, you can see that we have uh, search filters that are somewhat analogous to Google. So rather than images, news, videos, we have things like data resources, charts, uh, groups, or teams, and people. Um, the search cards have a hierarchy of information. The overall goal here is to help provide a lot of context to uh, basically allow users to quickly gauge the relevancy of something. So we have things like the name, the type, we highlight search terms, the owner of something when it was last updated, the number of views, et cetera. And we also try to show the top consumers of any given result set. So this is just another way to surface relationships and provide a lot more context. So continuing with this flow, uh, as from a search result, users typically want to explore a resource in greater detail. Um, so for this, we have content pages. And this is an example of a hive table content page. So at the top there, uh, we have a description, 
can link to the external resource and social features such as favoriting and pinning. So users can pin a resource to their team page, which I'll describe more in a second. Um, below that, we have metadata about the data resource. So who created it, when it was last updated, who consumes it, et cetera. Um, as John said, the relationships between nodes provide context. Um, and this is really unique. This isn't available really in any of our other siloed data tools. So it's something that makes the data portal really unique, tying this entire ecosystem together. Um, another way to surface graph relationships is through related content, so direct connections to this resource. For a data table, this could be something like the charts or dashboards, which directly pull from this data table. Um, you'll also notice that we have a lot of links. The idea here is that we want to promote exploration, so you could see who made this resource. You could then go on to find out what other resources that they work on, um, see if they're maybe like flirting with you by favoriting your resources, things like that. Um, also highlight some of the features we built out specifically for exploring data tables. Um, so one of these is that you can explore uh, basically column details and value distributions for any table. Um, additionally, uh, tracing data lineage is important. So we allow users to explore both the parent tables and the child tables of any given uh, table. We're also really excited about uh, being able to uh, enrich and edit metadata on the fly, so adding um, table descriptions, column contents, and these are pushed directly to our Hive meta store. Um, and so this abstracts a complex process that is actually, uh, even data scientists are pretty reluctant to do right now. Also highlight that uh, each of our content pages, so we have a content page for every type of resource and they're all kind of different. So this is highlighting our knowledge post, which is, again is where data scientists can kind of share analyses. We have dashboards and visualizations. And something to note here is that we're, we're typically iframing these data tools. So that generates a log, um, which then our graph picks up, and it will trickle back into our graph, affect page rank, affect the number of views and stuff. All right, so on to users. Users are the ultimate holders of tribal knowledge, so we created a dedicated uh, user page that reflects that. So on the left, you can see basic contact information if you need that. On the right, um, we highlight, you can view resources that the user uh, uses frequently, um, that they created, that they've favorited, and groups to which they belong. So really to help build trust in data, we wanted to be transparent about data. You can look at what anyone, what any resources a person views, what your manager views, et cetera. Along the lines of data transparency, we also made a conscious choice to keep former employees in the graph. Um, so if we take George here, the handsome intern that all the ladies talk about, he created a lot of data resources. Um, he favorited things. And if I wanted to find a cool dashboard that he made last summer that I forgot the name of, this can be really relevant. Another source of tribal knowledge um, within an organization is teams. So teams have tables that they query regularly, dashboards that they, go, that they look at, um, go-to metrics, definitions, et cetera. And we found that team members spend a lot of time telling people about the same resources, and they wanted a way to organize and curate basically to quickly link people to these items. So we, for that, we created group pages. Um, so there's a group overview. You can see who's in a particular team. Um, and to enable curating content, we decided to borrow some ideas from Pinterest. So basically, you can pin any sort of content to a page. You can ha there's basic organizational functionality. Um, in the case that a team doesn't have any content that's been curated, we have a popular tab, which you can't really see here. Um, but rather than displaying an empty page, we can leverage our graph to inspect what resources the people on a given team use on a regular basis and, and uh, basically give context that way. Also want to highlight that we tried to leverage thumbnails for maximum content text. So we gather something like 15,000 thumbnails from Tableau, our knowledge repo, um, and our superset uh, like internal data tool through a combination of APIs and uh, headless browser screenshots. I uh, just wanted to quickly highlight what the pinning and editing flows look like on the left. You, similar to Pinterest, you can pin an item to a team page. On the right, you can basically, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how you customize and rearrange the resources on a team page. All right, finally, we have company metric data. So we found that people on a team typically keep a tight pulse on relevant information for their team. But a lot of times, as the company grows larger, they'll feel more and more disconnected from the company level, high level metrics. So for that, we created a high level Airbnb dashboard where they can explore up to date company level data. 
So just quickly, I wanted to give an overview of the front end technology stack. Um, this is similar to many teams at Airbnb. Um, we leverage modern JavaScript, um, ES6. We use NPM to manage uh, package dependencies and build the application. We use an open source package called React from Facebook, which is really common now for uh, generating the DOM and the UI. We use Redux, which is an application state tool. Um, we use a pretty cool open source package from Khan Academy called Aphrodite, which just essentially allows you to write CSS and JavaScript. Um, we use ESLint to enforce a JavaScript style guide, um, also open source from Airbnb, and Enzyme Mocha and Chai for testing. So now I'll jump into a few of the challenges that we have in this project, that we face in the project. The first of which is that, uh, again, we're an umbrella data tool. We're trying to bring together all of our silo data tools um, and generate a picture of the overall ecosystem. So the problem with this is that any data tool, um, any umbrella data tool is vulnerable to changes in the upstream dependencies. So this could include things on the back end, like schema changes, which could break our graph generation, um, or URL changes, which would break the, break the front end. Additionally, data-dense design, like creating an, uh, a UI that's simple um, and still functional for people across a large number of data literacy levels is pretty challenging. Um, to complicate it, most internal design patterns aren't built for data-rich applications, so we had to do a lot of improv uh, improvising and creation of our own components. Um, John kind of alluded to this. We have a non-trivial Git-like merging of the graph that happens when we scrape um, everything from Hive and then push that to the production Neo4j instance. Um, and the data ecosystem is quite complex. Um, and for less data literate people, this um, can be confusing. So we've used the idea of proxy nodes in some cases to abstract some of this complexity. So an example is um, John mentioned that we have lots of data, data tables which are often replicated across different clusters. Non-technical users could be confused by this. So we actually accurately model it on the back end um, and then just expose a simplified proxy node on the front end. And so I'll wrap up with a couple of interesting future directions we're either thinking about um, or scheming. Uh, so the first of these is a more proper network analysis. So determining obsolete nodes. Um, in our case, this could be things like data tables that haven't been queried for a long time and are costing us thousands of dollars each month. Um, critical pass paths between different resources. Um, one idea that we're exploring is more of an active like curation of data resources. So if you search for something and you get five dashboards with the same name, it's, hard, it's often hard if you lack context to tell which one of those is relevant to you. So we have these passive mechanisms like page rank and surfacing metadata that would hopefully push down the crap in our graph and surface more relevant things, but we are thinking about more active forms of certification um, that we could boost in uh, search ranking further. Uh, we're also excited about moving from active exploration to deliver more relevant updates and content suggestions through alerts and recommendations. So this could be things like your dashboard is broken, this table you created is, hasn't been queried for several months and is costing us X amount of dollars. Um, this group that you follow just added a lot of new content. Um, and then finally, what feature set would be complete without gamification? Um, so we're thinking about just providing like, fun ways to provide content producers with a sense of value, so surfacing things like you have the most viewed dashboard this month or something like that. Uh, and I'll quickly give a shout out to the team. So John and I are two software engineers on the team. Uh, Michelle is a third software engineer. We have some part-time support from uh, designer Eli and our product manager Jeff. We're all based in San Francisco. Um, and then I'll quickly give a shout out. If you're interested in this topic or want more details, we'll have a blog post that uh, should be rolling out tomorrow uh, morning California time. Um, and that'll be on Medium, so you can check that out. So with that, we wanted to say thank you. I'm not sure if we have time for questions. <laughs>